My name is Akshay. Welcome to another session of Talks at Google. Our guest today, in case you didn't know, is uh, the legendary Indian fast bowler and the current ICC match referee, Javagal Srinath. He started his career Indian cricket in the 90s and uh, retired about 13 years later in, 2000, in the 2000s. So you've obviously, hopefully, rather watched him and his skill on TV. Um, and he's here to share some of those stories with us. He is, uh, incidentally, only the only Indian fast bowler and the only other, so there's two of them in India who have taken more than 300 one-day wickets. And uh, he's also the joint highest wicket taker for India in World Cups at 44. Uh, he retired uh, from, in, uh, from cricket, like I said, in 2003. And uh, he is, uh, has continued his life uh, in that world as ICC match referee. So please uh, help me in welcoming Mr. Javagal Srinath. Uh, so it's an honor sir, to have you here. As you can see, uh, there are many of your fans in the room today, and uh, many others uh, will watch this uh, on YouTube at some point. So uh, uh, from all of us, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, you have been uh, in the Bay Area before. You have some family here. Uh, what's your best part about this area? Which area do you like the most? Some interesting memory from here? See, most of us like typical middle-class family coming from India, and especially coming from Bangalore and Mysore. Uh, we all want to become engineers. We all want to come to U.S. I think that's... <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of you all here, actually. <laughs> and that's a dream for many. So but then, you know, you've got to be 80%, 90%. Um, you know, a percentage dhoka de diya. So I could not come on this percentage basis. I could not, um, academic percentage basis, I could not come to India. Then the other option I thought was, you know, play cricket and know the right kind of people here, so you get to Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been here a few times, yes. Um, I also tried to get into Stanford in 2003 after I finished my uh, cricketing career. So, in fact, I made some inroads, and then I think uh, there was a sensible professors who were talking to me, and then they said, look, you know, do you want to give all your cricketing credentials back and then get into software industry at this age? It will be, you know, look, it will be a regression. It will be going back in times if you do that. So it's better, you know, you start something on your own. So I was here for almost a week and more than a week, I think, trying to understand whether I fit into this. Um, I don't know whether I did the right decision, but, uh, you know, um, I had to. Then I was convinced, I was convinced, or they convinced me rather, that, um, you know, that might not be. Or maybe they found out that I was not too good and I would never pass the <laughs> MBA in uh, Stanford. Even that could be possible. Um, however, yeah. Um, so I just have a degree. That's it, engineering degree. So you are um, now an ICC match referee. What else are you doing? Uh, are you involved in the technical space? Uh, I, not really, but my involvement with technical space is because of my friends uh, whom I tang along with. Uh, we have a you know, group of few friends, um, you know, we are very much in touch with each other. One of them is sitting here, he has moved to Google now from India, uh, Mohan Das. Um, so it, even though you don't know much about technical stuff, if you have technical people around you, it's as, it's as good as the same, I think. I mean, you are as good as a good engineer yeah. in many ways. <laughs> so, uh, now you mentioned you use a lot of Google products. <coughs> Do you have a favorite one that you use uh, more than others? I think the best application is your Google search. Yeah. So you, for anything, everything, I think we go for Google. I think it has become such an integral part of our lives that, um, you know, that reach is fantastic. I mean, you don't have to worry too much, no matter what. I mean, I, you know, I have a 50-year-old son. I got to teach him a lot uh, these days. So, you know, the linear equations, the quadratic equations, which I didn't know then, <laughs> uh, before Google could uh, come up, I mean, before Google could come up, I used to uh, log into Mohandas.com, who is sitting here. <laughs> um, but now I think, now I have upgraded myself, and I go to Google and uh, uh, check most of it. So you get uh, all the answers and stuff. So a lot of these people here work on many of the products that uh, a lot of us use. So if you have any, uh, you know, positive or negative feedback, this is a good time to let them know. 
and then hopefully they can you know they could <laughs> implement the features you're looking for so nothing uh, negative I, yeah. I suppose um, in any walk of life I think it is that you know we pursue a technology you know we we follow technology and what technology today is will not be the same in the next five ten years so you know there is nothing called completeness in technology I believe um, you got to keep following you got to keep researching as you people do and uh, you will end up uh, probably doing new products and getting on to new technology in the future. So, you know, if you really see what was happening 20 years ago and what technology we live in, completely different. I mean, people have pursued technology and you people change, evolve and, and new things come up. So, um, there is no negative as such. Uh, the, the successful of the product or the popularity of the product not necessarily means success. I think widely used, yes. Well, is this success? Could be a success in one dimension. But I think that will have an end and then there is a new product, there is a new technology and you move on. So, uh, I do not see anything negative. I think you, Google is a wonderful um, uh, present to the whole world. I mean, everything runs on Google. Today, if you switch off the Google, the traffic in the world stands. I mean, it becomes a standstill. Uh, many things, I mean, Google search, if there is no search, Google search. Again, people will struggle. So, we are dependent on Google. So, what you people do matters to us um, at every level. So, thank you for that. So, let's, uh, let's talk about cricket, switch gears a little bit uh, and start from the very beginning. How did you get into cricket is one thing, but when did you realize that you had the talent to play for the country? When I didn't get marks in the <laughs> exam. <laughs> then I realized I think cricket will be a better bet. Look, um, you know, two things, passion and your profession. Passion and hobby comes in the same line and uh, profession is another one. Now, for profession, um, uh, you know, you, you have to study, you got to get marks, you got to be in that rat race in India. Um, you, you know, it's, it's quite tough. Uh, you got to be intelligent, your IQ should be more and, and all of it. Uh, not all of them, all of us are gifted with the same, um, barring you people sitting here. Um, cricket was a passion for me. And, um, but uh, somehow or the other, you know, I got into engineering. Now, seriously, why I got into engineering? Because that was the trend going on those days. You know, there is a social status. There is something about being an engineer. Not that I wanted to achieve anything became, becoming an engineer. So, you, you are seen in a different light altogether. And, and that's exactly my understanding, let me be honest. Um, got into engineering. Of course, it was not a straightforward seat. I mean, my parents had to pull in some money and give some donations and, and put me into the seat because I ne never got a seat on merit. So, I promised them that, you know, I will finish my degree and I will do well. Uh, but cricket was, you know, came alongside and I was doing decently well, reasonably well. Um, you know, played for Karnataka under 23s and then I played for Karnataka juniors. So, my idea was that if I represent Karnataka state, I can fail in four subjects. <laughs> so, some amount of justification within. Um, so, whenever I didn't do well in studies, I said, well, it is uh, in the cricket which is really coming in the way and I had to spend more cricket there. And, so, whenever I didn't get wickets, I used to say it's because of my engineering, I'm still <laughs> <coughs> We managed this lie somehow, uh, nicely in life. <laughs> so, that's how we managed and I managed and, um, but, but I always had one thing in my mind that, you know, you've got to have a degree in India, no matter what. I think um, uh, for, for, a, for a level of exp ex acceptance, you've got to have a degree. Without a degree, you struggle in India. The first thing, if you really see anybody who will, you meet in India, either so, that's the basic question that you need to answer. The moment you say that you don't have a degree, then they do it straight away, they look down upon you. I mean, that's, that's the Indian way of, in a way, that's a motivation for us to at least have a degree. Um, anyway, back to this. Um, so, I managed somehow and, uh, you know, slowly I realized that uh, my cricket was coming good and then I probably spent more time. But I never thought that my, you know, cricket would be my profession. Even today, I will never advocate in India that 
sport can be a profession. The economy doesn't support that. You've got to have a strong economy otherwise for you to fall back on sport as a profession. So once you finish your profession, whether you make it to India or whatever it is, you should still make a decent living. That you cannot do in India when you risk uh, your education and then take up sport. Um, but anyway, I was employed in a Vijaya Bank, uh, in a bank called Vijaya Bank, you all know. Um, they came in, uh, you know, in my third year. Um, so when I, when I was a bona fide student, um, I was already uh, earning money, so which is not legal. But nobody knew that I was employed with the bank. <laughs> so I was able to, uh, you know, manage both. Uh, that came in as a bit of a support because, um, you know, I lost a year. Uh, when I was in third year, um, semester became very difficult for me. Semester scheme was a little tough because every six months we used to have exams. Our college, JCE in Mysore, uh, stood by me uh, like a rock. Uh, you know, they could change exams and stuff and all of it. Um, then I lost a year. But some amount of justification that, you know, worst case, I will be a bank clerk. Um, from then on, you know, I progressed and then I became a, I played for India. And then was gradually I became an officer in the bank. And those days, being an officer in the bank was the thing. And it was quite a decent job, I, I, perhaps. Um, you know, it's still, I wasn't very clear, well, will this be my career for the next 15, 20 years? Uh, slowly, I get, think I got to terms with this game and understood what is required to stay here for, for the next few years. And... As time went by, I got the gist of uh, how to make this a profession, a hobby into a profession, probably the best, the best thing that could happen to anybody, uh, and stuck to it. And, and, and I had an injury in 96, then I had four subjects to go. And in 1996, I went back to the college, um, stood in front of my lecturers, and then I pleaded, saying that I need 35 marks to pass so that I get a degree. <laughs> and then um, some of them were really good. I mean, they took some special classes, and um, I am indebted to them for life, actually, for that. And uh, they did a wonderful job, and I was able to pass those four subjects, and I got my degree in 1997. Indian pitches in the 90s were not known to help uh, people like yourself who were into the art of face bowling. You um, were probably more successful in India than overseas. Uh, what, did you realize early on, and how did you adapt to those conditions? Yeah, you know, it was quite um, hard to bowl on Indian pitches, but, um, um, you know, you, you, you start adding more when, when, when the situation is very adverse. Um, you know, you start to believe in reverse swing, you try to move the ball more. Um, it also adds pressure on your career, so that's in a way good at the right time. So that always keeps you on the toes. Um, what happens when you are under pressure, you are trying to do your best, you are trying to learn a lot, you are spending more time in the nets. I think that's what my peers saw in me, to hold, hold on to me in the side for the next three, four years. So I think, uh, you know, an attitude which was good in many sense. I think I was also a little insecure to start with, but realize that, you know, that, lit, that, that pressure, uh, when, when things are not at your best, when you have three fast, three spinners playing in a team, and then I've been picked because I'm more of a symbolic fast bowler to be part of the side. Now, being a part of the team, I mean, you've got to contribute to some extent. You know, you've got to try, even if you don't get a wicket, but you've got to bowl those 15, 20 overs to make, to make myself believe that I'm part of this team instead of just standing there doing nothing for hours together. Um, maybe that, that was subconsciously I was doing such things without my own knowledge and that was recognized and um, that helped me to learn a few things. Um, so adverse conditions also gives you a chance to look for um, some kind of growth within ourselves. I uh, want to talk briefly about the, the injury you mentioned of, uh, in 96. Yeah. Uh, you had a rotator cuff tear. Yeah. I remember watching, um, I, I believe it was a test series against uh, South Africa. Correct. Um, and I, I remember clearly watching you sort of, uh, you know, rubbing your shoulder. Uh, you would throw the ball underarm from the yeah. fence. Clearly you were in pain. Um, why did you continue playing and why not just stop and attend to your injury? The assessment of an injury is always a challenging one. Um, you know, when, you know, you want to bowl as much as possible. You want to kind of um, bowl the last ball and then um, kind of come to terms that you're injured. I mean, that's probably the way any sportsman would, would want to see. 
Um, even if you can bowl an over, you don't want to stop it. You want to finish that over. But this injury was so unique that when the body is warmed up, when my shoulder is nicely warmed up, you could bowl more and more. But once you stop, the damage would happen then. Um, basically, the ball was coming out of the socket. And um, there was phrase, you know, there is something called labrum cartilage here um, at the socket. And, um, you know, that, that plastic thing which holds the ball in the socket, that had, um, you know, almost, uh, you know, worn out. So it's finally, I realized that um, I couldn't even lift my arm, and that was the time I realized, you know, I need to go and see a doctor. So I went to South Africa to one of the doctors in, uh, um, in a Rosebank Clinic, and uh, they, are, they have the best facilities, in fact. Um, they said that we need a unit an operation. So I tried for a conservative method for uh, three years, uh, for three months, didn't help. So then the only option I had was to go under the knife. So went in under the knife, um, then again rehabilitation and all of this for another six months. Now the honest um, uh, opinion I got from the doctor was also helped me. And they said you will probably lose 15% of your efficiency. But if you are very keen and if you go through the rehabilitation and, and the physiotherapy and the strengthening uh, process nicely, then probably you might get that 10% too. So you might probably lose 5%. Um, that's meaning nothing, you lose nothing. And uh, thank God uh, it took six months. Um, it got my degree back and six months time I've also got my hand back. So <laughs> <coughs> it was a, a challenging times, yeah. It was really challenging times. Now I know, I remember reading interviews of yours back then and you mentioned that you were worried this was a career ending injury for you. Obviously you recovered, you spent many more years uh, playing for the country. Um, what did you learn from this? Uh, how did you keep yourself going through? And now that you look back, obviously the injury is a fairly minor episode in your life uh, because you've come through it. Uh, so, yeah, I think um, it was a, um, you know, it's a lifetime experience, I would say. I mean, it is, you know, if I probably speak on your behalf, it is that just that, you know, your mind tomorrow doesn't work for Google or for any software technology from tomorrow. That's it. There is nothing that you can do as far as technology is concerned. Or what do you do? What do you, how do you manage? I mean, these things do cross my mind. I mean, it's not that I can't play for India, nor I can never play cricket. If, 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 if things don't go right, um, I can never bowl again in my life. Now, can I become a batsman? Uh, can I, <laughs> what do I do? Um, then I have, uh, well, I was 26. I had another uh, 34 years of career ahead of me. Now, should I really come back and then start my engineering at that stage, where I was anyway lagging quite behind? Well, I mean, it, I could have probably done that. Uh, I would have been sitting somewhere here listening to somebody else. Uh, I don't know whether Mondas will approve this. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, that crossed my mind, but um, uh, it, it's good to go through such experiences in life. Um, it gives you, makes you more philosophical. Uh, you will be fatalistic in your thinking at times. Um, then you realize that uh, cricket is not the only thing in your life. Then probably my focus on other side of life also um, grew a bit. Um, then I realize that if it happens at the age of 26, um, I need to manage next 34 years. It can happen at the age of 35. Even when I finish my cricket at the age of 35, what do I do for the next 25 years? So all those thoughts started coming into my mind. Um, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of uh, belief in God, um, all of a sudden, you know, you become spiritual to some extent. Uh, not the spirits. I didn't go to that way. <laughs> yeah, then I think uh, you kind of meet the right kind of people during that period. And I think, you know, whenever we get to such situations in life, and um, if you honestly, genuinely want to come back into sport or you want to do good, I think you, if you have that mindset, then you will probably approach the right kind of people. I mean, I met some wonderful people during that period, started talking to them. I mean, uh, you know, you, know you, you, you believe that somebody is better than you. Somebody's advice can help you. I think we need to have such mentors in life. We've got to believe in such people. It's just not that, you know, I am the be all and all of life. You know, there are a lot of people who have more experience. They did not have to play cricket. They need not have to take 200 wickets, but I think uh, people with knowledge and the way they see life, 
um, I went in search of them. I mean, some of them um, I could I could speak to. Again, they gave me some valuable advice to be steady, stable, finish your degree first. You know, such advices were crucial. Gave me confidence that you know I have a degree, I can manage life from now on. Um, you know, the, such advices uh, came in very handy at that point in time. Um, at the same time, managing an injury it was a wonderful experience too. Um, you know, your commitment to rehabilitation, your commitment to uh, strength training, then that measured approach towards bowling again. You know, you, you cannot be bowling more, nor you can be bowling less. So that fine balance, what you achieve in trying to come back, um, you know, brought all those uh, good values in me. So I realized fine balancing is all about life. You know, you hear many stories about Indian sports legends who, uh, you know, their parents don't off, always, always support them because a career in sports, like you said, is not really a thing that was uh, relied upon in India. Uh, but everyone always has some person in their life who supports them through their growing phases through in the, into the sport. Did you have anybody like that who helped you through, you know, playing for your college, playing for the state? A lot of people make mistakes in looking for such uh, people. I mean, you search people for the wrong reasons, I think you end up in the wrong place. Um, never ever in my life that I wanted to go and meet somebody that, that who will give me an undue advantage in my own profession. I think uh, if you're looking people for the right reasons, um, it could be uh, your career discussion about your career path. It could be about um, an honest opinion about uh, my own cricket. You know, a, a very brutal, somebody who could do a brutal ass assessment about my own career. Those are the people whom we need to go and look up to. Um, you know, if, if, you kind, if you start looking, at, you know, looking up to such people, um, they are your true mentors. Um, but I mean, if I really, I never had, I mean, I have seen some of my own colleagues meeting the wrong kind of people for wrong support. And you, they might appear to be the demigods at that time. They might be looking like godfathers for you at that point in time, but they are not actually. I think they can lead you to the wrong um, side of the life. Um, I never had anybody, but I think uh, Mr. C.S. Subramaniam, one of our club secretaries um, back in Mysore, I think he was a wonderful person. A great human being who instilled a lot of values in us, who always said that education is the one which gives you solid security for you to think and play the sport without any doubts. And uh, he always said, you know, if you want to be analytical, you've got to have education by your side. To think better in life is where education comes to your rescue, uh, not for anything else. Uh, it is just not about earning salaries or managing money, but I think uh, for you to think better you need education. So whether you are in, whatever you become in life, I think education has to be the base. So such things, not said in these words what I said, but I think that's exactly how we guided us. Um, of course, my parents were wonderful. I mean, they were always supportive of me in whatever I do, whatever I did. So yeah, that was also, uh, you know, something which I, I, was, I was probably lucky. So you, uh, you formed a great bowling partnership with uh, Venkatesh Prasad. And uh, I've certainly enjoyed many of those matches that you played. What was your relationship like with him? And what was it like working with, uh, with him over all those years and all those matches? Bad and good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was one of the biggest critic of mine, actually. You know, he always used to, um, I still remember in one of the games uh, um, where we were playing in Kanpur and then he was dropped. So there were three spinners and myself. And um, we kind of, um, I got a wicket and I was standing at the fine leg. And uh, I asked for some water, you know. So he was the 12th man and then he used to walk very slowly. <laughs> 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 he used to walk very slowly up to me and then he stood next to me and then I said, um, did you see the replay? He said, yes. Then I said, what? He said, missing down the leg side by four stumps. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you are a lucky bowler, do you know that? <laughs> um, that wasn't out. Uh, and even the first one, the umpiring is so horrible. <laughs> so that was the motivation what I got from him. And you know, there was a camera next, next to us. And then when the camera is focusing on us, there is a red light which comes on. So the moment that camera came on, then he was patting my back. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, but 
we shared a great relationship with uh, each other, and then I used to tease him that you know you got to bowl fast. I mean, he. Was <laughs> So we had a very healthy relationship and uh, we had a good laugh and we shared most of the, you know, our, our backdrop was very similar in life. So we, sh we kind of shared the same food and the same taste, most of it. So, um, you know, we had a great time, of course. He's a good gentleman and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed his, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed his company. Uh, which has been your favorite uh, ground to play on? See, when you win a match, I think, uh, irrespective of what the state of, and then you have got wickets in that particular match, yeah. then you'll always, you, it is hard to say that's not my favorite. But I think uh, Centurion Park um, in, in Pretoria, South Africa, was, was one of the best grounds. But now all grounds have, you know, really come up nicely. I mean, MCG is a fabulous ground. If you see it, um, the Melbourne Cricket Ground is, is beautiful. I mean, if you see. Um, Lords has its own charm. Uh, Surrey Oval is is beautiful. Our own Calcutta uh, Eden Gardens are is, is wonderful. Uh, many, I would say, and of course our Bangalore is also pretty cute. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you've played with some really big names in world cricket. Um, I want to ask you about three specific people. So I'll give you a name, and if you can give us a story or a memory or something like that. Uh, first up, uh, Kapil Dev. I think he was my um, mentor. I, I, I kind of grew, uh, grew up watching him and learned a lot from him. Um, I think we have shared various stages of relationship with him. Um, as I said, he was my demigod. I emulated him. Um, then we started playing together. Um, then we have kind of challenged each other. Uh, I think that's the beauty of this um, life, isn't it? I mean, somebody... But in the when I was you know I'm talking about 83 when when I thought she was my god, and then you start playing with him, and then in three years time you kind of challenge uh, him as well in many ways. Uh, you know when you work in the same space, and then when you're working for a common objective, the way he wants to achieve it, the way I want to do it are two different things. Our strengths were different. I mean in his talent, his natural ability was unbelievable. He was uh, next to none. In fact. He was too good. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, it's sometimes, you know, you, you know, what I feel is that when, when somebody is great, he should also have the ability to impart that knowledge to somebody and then take him up to the next level. I believe leaders are like that. I mean, you, leaders are somebody who create leaders. Uh, so I was expecting a lot from him. So it's not that uh, he didn't do it. Maybe I was not smart enough to pick up points from him as well. So, you know, there was a bit of... Um, uh, you know, it was quite challenging on me to understand what he speaks and what he says. You see, coaching is never easy. It's, it's not all that easy to pick up points and then uh, implement it on yourself. Uh, our motor learning skills are not that sharp. Uh, changes in human body, especially the bowling action changes and all, will take ages, three to four years. So it is easy to say something, but it is not that easy to really... Um, kind of assimilate it into your cells and then reproduce it. So it takes a while for all of us to do that. But I think uh, with, with, with Kapil Dev, I, I learned a lot. Um, I still feel that uh, I, shouldn't, I, I should have learned a lot. And I also believe that he, shouldn't, he should have taught me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of it. Uh, I think I would say all of it. Um, great experience with him, actually. So I have seen Kapil uh, as an angster. I have seen him as a senior in the team and we have competed for the same wickets on either sides of the pitch. Um, it's a wonderful experience. I still have a lot of regards for him. Sachin Tendulkar. Genius, um, unbelievable um, talent, um, a little bit of a difficult personality to understand him. But once you get to know the card of Sachin, I think um, uh, he's a, a good human being. Uh, represents typically middle class, um, uh, you know, middle class system. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm really happy that you know I got a chance to play alongside with him. Um, again, it was not easy to deal with him when we played together. Um, Kapil was. Uh, sorry, uh, Sachin 
uh, was too demanding. I mean, that also shows his passion for the game. I mean, if he was somebody who could do anything, be it with the ball or with the uh, bat, he could do anything, which we could not. Lesser mortals could not uh, do what he, repeat what he did. So he was quite demanding. But I think a little later he changed. Um, he was a much evolved captain, um, much better captain. Um, you know, I still have a good relationship with him. We have a good laugh. Um, well, we miss him on the field, but that's what uh, cricket is all about, life is all about, that everybody has to move on. Um, I really enjoyed uh, watching him uh, play for, alongside with him. And last but not least, a good friend of yours, uh, Anil Kumble. Uh, good friend. Um, doesn't say much. <laughs> doesn't say much. A uh, man of few words, uh, but an absolute gentleman. Um, you know, somebody... Um, you know, very strong, deep inside, um, you know, very resolute in his nature, highly determined, um, you know, for some, you know, whatever the limitations that anybody could have, but to achieve maximum, I think he's the standing example for that. Um, um, man of high integrity, and uh, I would say uh, one of the best friends I have uh, around in the cricketing circles. So we share a lot. We did a good stint with Karnataka State Cricket Association. Um, we came for a right reasons to defend our association for three years. We did it successfully. Uh, we enjoyed working with him. Um, a lot of similarities in the way we think. Uh, that helps us quite a bit. And um, we understand each other better. How, by the way, how Is Rahul Dravid not part of that list? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's <laughs> Let's talk about let's talk about Rahul Dravid. Which state do you come from? Uh, Maharashtra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Rahul Dravid. <laughs> well, that's why I have such a Dhanukar in the list. See? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, let's talk about Rahul. I will tell Rahul Dravid that you have missed out on the yeah. list. Now. <laughs> huh? no, let's talk about Rahul Dravid. He's. I think he's a brother still. Yeah, yeah. We'll move on. We'll move on. That's okay. All right. So how how did uh, Anil Kumble get the name Jumbo? You 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 always heard. Siddhu named him Jumbo actually. Um, because, uh, you know, at one stage he was like taking off like uh, Jumbo, you know, from 93 to 96, 97. I mean, he was unplayable in India. Uh, he got his 100th wicket within no time and he was winning matches. So, Sidhu named him uh, as Jumbo. So, uh, speaking of Jumbo, India versus Pakistan, 99, Pakistan are nine wickets down. <laughs> You were bowling from the other end. I, you tried really hard to bowl wides, and in fact, you bowled a couple of real wides, which is hard in test cricket. But uh, um, j just to help your friend out, now, uh, Bakar Yunus was batting there, and he hits the ball in the air. You see Sadhu Gopan Ramesh yeah, running yeah. after it really fast. <laughs> he made no attempt to not take the catch. He actually tried. What was going through your mind? You see, I mean, history is being created. And so uh, how do I be part of that history is by not taking the <laughs> wicket. <laughs> and uh, that one wicket is not going to make any difference to me at all. If I had taken that wicket, nobody would have spoken about it. Yeah. Even you would not have asked that question today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, I think it was a conscious decision. And then, you know, the way Anil was bowling, that he was looking as if he's going to get wicket every ball. So, um, I think it was anybody's duty to make sure that, uh, you know, not to take any wicket for that moment <laughs> and, and uh, you know, enable him to get that wicket. So uh, I think uh, he finished off the match within no time. And I think uh, that's the way you kind of help somebody to create records and stuff. So, uh, that was 10 wickets in a match is no joke. Um, that was a fabulous performance. One of my fondest memories, and I know some other people share this uh, opinion as well, uh, of your career is uh, of your batting with, uh, with uh, Anil Kumble against uh, Australia. You had a 52-run partnership. Um, I, uh, I still remember that, that match. You came out, you swung the bat a few times, you missed a few, few balls. And um, Anil walked down and said a few things to you, and then you seemed to settle down and you hit a few sixes. Um, what, what was the conversation I going? I was in good form. I was teaching Anil how to bat. <laughs> No, it was just a chat, I think. Uh, I don't remember every word that yeah. we spoke. Um, no, it was one of those matches, um, you know, where everything fell in place and, and we won a wonderful match from nowhere. 
um, good I don't know why that match has been recognized and then people talk about it quite a lot and you know <laughs> Uh, maybe we were so hopeless down the order that we could not win any <laughs> matches. And then one odd match which we won, I think, uh, that got stuck in the minds of people and even now people talk about it. Yeah, that was one of the good wins. And that too, it happened in Bangalore, my hometown, so it added more value, I suppose. You, uh, you did exceptionally <coughs> well in, uh, in World Cups uh, yeah. for India. I is there something about that stage that brings out... Uh, at least in you, uh, that you know, that brought out a different side, or was that just another match for you? Except the finals of the World Cup, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, I think your your awareness levels uh, rises quite a bit. Uh, you want to do well, and then there is so much of hype, and uh, and the whole nation starts um, pushing you towards it. Um, I think every nation will do that, but in India, it is little more. Uh, because of the numbers what we have and the following what we have and that also puts a bit of pressure um, which is good I, I feel and, and also nice to uh, have that kind of support. Um, yeah, I mean four World Cups, I think we had a couple of ordinary World Cups but twice I think we were really there, uh, we couldn't make it to the finals. We were up against a wonderful team which was unbeatable then. I mean, they were really, uh, Australia was, was probably the best team and there was no other way to beat them. It's a cycle, you see. I mean, Australia, now if you see Australia, I think India is probably doing so well. Um, you know, Australia is not a team what it used to be. So um, we got caught in that particular zone where they were really good and we couldn't do much in the finals, yeah. So let's uh, switch gears, um, speak about uh, possibly your second passion in technology. Um, you are, as they say here in Silicon Valley, a techie. This is a word that's pretty... <laughs> I'm not a techie for sure. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you introduced uh, technology into Indian cricket very early on. Um, and I, I remember reading an interview where you said that uh, technology helped Sachin's career, extended it um, um, beyond what it uh, would have otherwise been. What was the, the teams and the coaching staff's reception to, uh, to technology when you first brought it up uh, 20 years ago? It wasn't accepted so accepted so easily. I mean, it was a struggle for me to convince people. Maybe my communication, my articulation in trying to convince people about what technology could do was wrong. You see, when you go to people and then say that technology is going to help you, it's going to teach you something, the first reaction was, what can technology teach me? I think that's where I went wrong in trying to convince our own players. Probably I, would have, I should have said that technology will make you a guru to find your own student within. That would have been a better phrase to say. I could not have, I didn't have that many words then maybe. So I was just trying to say that is going to help you. Technology will tell you what to do. So they were not happy because technology was more akin, anything, any screen was more akin to televisions than uh, what exactly run a computer does. Um, so, I, you know, I, was, I failed to convince them to start with and especially when I was talking to them before the product was developed, uh, I failed to convince them, uh, try to, I, I failed to build an imagination in the minds of each of the players. So then I realized I think the product should be ready and then take it to them, it becomes more convincing. So at the uh, very concept stage, it was hard for, for me to sell that to the to the players. So once the <coughs> technology was ready, and once we started showing them, um, then they understood what exactly technology could do. So it was basically the difference. You know, they were able to see what they did when they were doing well, and what they are doing when they are struggling. So when those two pitches came next to each other, so cognitively they were able to find those minute differences, and then start correction, start correcting themselves. So that's so it is the access, it is the quick access of pictures which made them, uh, which made coaching more easy, which made their, uh, you know, the corrections uh, quicker. Um, you could not have done that otherwise, where you could not even sync, I'm talking about 1990, 2000, where, you know, get uh, one of the pictures on the television here and the second picture on the, in the, in the second screen, and then, you know, to move that, uh, to synchronize those two pictures was never possible those days. Uh, it was quite a challenging stuff for anyone. So once the system came in, it became quite easy. I mean, those days were tough, you know. In 2000, we are looking at a small 
RAM, uh, 516 RAM used to be this big, PCB. I'm sure you're all youngsters sitting here, you would not even seen those actually. <laughs> uh, that was, was, was this big. And then we, we put in a system uh, which was this big, almost like a one big uh, dabba it was. <laughs> An ugly looking thing in fact. And that used to go blue. You know, every second minute, you know, we used to, it used to heat up so much, uh, it was not possible for us to uh, handle it. Um, and then um, one Mr. Mohandas came in and then reduced, uh, he is sitting here, right here. He was the one who reduced uh, from almost 70,000 lines of course, he brought it down to 9,000 within a month's time, made the machine more efficient. In fact, he is the architect of uh, technology in sport in India. Uh, nobody even knew what technology could do and in fact we had advanced to such stage that even star came and said we will do something for your uh, technology we will we will take it to the next level um, so it was the need to um, you know to address a grave situation what we had where we never had feedbacks uh, you know coaches could not even communicate where we were going wrong coaches found it very difficult to address um, you know the, the 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 weaknesses or the strengths of the opponents. So unless otherwise we had um, quick access to the video pictures. So that was once that was done, I think it became more easier for us to understand you know where we went wrong and how to analyze and that's when I think we really understood uh, the correction part of cricket. So I think essentially what you're saying is when you pr gave your t your player your team information yeah. that really helped them. So now, um, it's an interesting point because Google and a number of the companies in Silicon Valley have uh, thrived uh, with collecting such information and such data and analyzing them and building machine learning models and so on. Do you see a role for big data and machine learning in cricket? I think it is heading that way perhaps in the near future. I mean, how, how I see, uh, you know, technology uh, moving forward, I think now we have hit a saturation, more or less it is nothing but, uh, you know, a straightforward data which is every um, ball becomes a file stored in the database with many attributes and then you have a query screen and you keep calling it, uh, whichever you want. But I mean that limit, that has been there from the last now 15-20 years now, so we got to move forward. Um, that could be probably, um, you know, um, as you said, it could be the uh, machine learning, it could be um, still the work would be the same, uh, it won't uh, change anything, but um, you know the way it is, uh, the, the analyst um, kind of capture those pictures uh, will be different. Um, they will probably, you know, it can recognize the face um, and then uh, you know say that this is the bowler who is bowling at the, maybe it can understand the action and then say he's the bowler and uh, whatever the outcome of the ball, um, but I know for me I think uh, the next level is uh, what a player feels on the field, how, what are my energy levels, uh, what is my, um, I would say, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the energy levels within me, I mean how do you uh, understand the energy levels, it could be, um, uh, you know the lactic acid deposits in your in your in your blood. Uh, how long can I? So if I have some indication, if I have some feedback within my own system to say that look, you're getting a little tired now. You got to replenish now. Um, will that be the way forward in cricket? I think it is all about where technology meets life sciences. You know, um, how do you read your heart rate? C can you read your sweat? Can you read the blood? I don't know how you do it, but can you read that? What kind of information you get out of it? What is my um, mindset? Now, there is a beautiful uh, tool which I saw recently where all the ECGs, what you see now, now that's more or less your heart rate monitors which you wear on your chest and then understand your heart rate and your optimum heart rate is so and so and um, and at the same time now there is uh, this encephalograph which reads the brain signals. Uh, I saw a tool the other day in India, somebody was trying to um, you know get my opinion on it, where your left brain is more logical, right is more emotional. So 
when you make a decision, which one is functioning? So you have an app where you see and then you decide this is the right time for you to make a decision. <laughs> now, now these things are coming in. Now I think at some point, I think all these gadgets will be part of your life when you're walking and then you you will realize that you know this is I think what is now I mean where is head, where is this technology leading now you want to know everything what is happening in your body on your app correct everything everything anything everything what's my sugar levels um, what's my salt levels within the body what is that I want what is the one which is the one um, you know what is the deficiency that I have now what is that I need to add I mean it could be diabetes it could be anything for that matter so probably it is heading in the direction uh, at this point in time. Um, so even in sport, what is my water retention in the body? Uh, is, is, am, am I losing too many minerals and salts um, in my body that is uh, making me tired? So as of now, we just go and drink water because we are losing it. But what's the right amount of water that is uh, important for us? What is the right amount of salt uh, that is important for me? I think probably in the next five to six years, we'll be heading in the direction where, um, you know, we'll be getting what we want exactly. So back to your, love, you know, machine learning and stuff. Yeah, it can uh, help, but more than anything else, I want Google to find out where a cricket match is happening throughout the world. Where are the open grounds for us to make proper cricket grounds? <laughs> Honestly, in, in, 2000, in 2011 to 2013, I used to see Google Maps to see where there are grounds in Bangalore, where there are empty spaces where I can go and approach them for a, you know, to lease those grounds for us to prepare a proper cricket pitch. Um, in fact, uh, the JC ground where we made the ground, uh, where we built a ground, I, you know, first, the first thing was that this is the place where we, I went through the Google, through the Google Map, there is a space here, so why don't we approach JC to give this space for us to uh, put in a ground. So, you know, Google has also played a role everywhere. But I think at some stage, Google will have the rights to get actively participating on real-time basis, um, you know, when, when in the, on the Google search. So I don't know whether it is possible or not, but um, it might happen in the future. Okay. Let's hope. Um, what, what is your uh, opinion of the decision review system that we have in cricket today? Technology will be part of, uh, I think, uh, cricket from now on uh, because uh, television has become so good. Um, even the slightest movement with those uh, slow motions and the quality of the cameras have improved so much that it is beyond human capabilities. So umpires will not be able to see from a distance, um, you, know, uh, you know, those little nicks or deviations, so on and so forth. But the demand at the other end has been so high for uh, cricket, uh, for the good decisions. Uh, everybody wants good decisions, fair decisions. So without technology, you will not be able to achieve it. So even then, there will be a little bit of uh, errors here and there, uh, but that is tolerable errors. Uh, so technology will be part of it. So DRS will be uh, integral part of sports from now on. Do, do you see um, DRS combined with machine learning replacing human umpires in cricket at some point? You see, I think we cannot think um, cricket or technology um, as a master at any stage. I think to understand the soul, I don't know, no matter how much improvements you do, what kind of intelligence you build, it, is, it cannot understand the soul and the mind of a human being. I think technology has to be one level below at, at any stage. I mean, the decision making has to be in the hands of the person, I mean, the, the human beings. Um, you might probably get the best of best information to make the right decision, but it should be the, um, you know, the humans at the top making all the decisions. So the man is always the master and technology should be the slave. Uh, I don't think the other way is possible. So if you take away the entire human element, so even if there is an inherent mistake at, at any stage, you might probably get few things right, uh, but that human element, that, that, that fun part will be missing. Then you don't even need uh, players on either side. You can get some <laughs> robots to play. <laughs> Where, where, is the, where is the fun then? I think you'll, India will put 11 best robots and the uh, US will also put 12 best robots to play <laughs> on the field and 
uh, that's how the game goes. So, yeah. I have uh, one last question for you. Um, you are currently an ICC match referee. You've also um, done a lot of motivational talks um, for corporations and such. Um, what's next for you in your life? I think you can plan for a good life, but um, I've, I've been happy-go-lucky in many ways, which might not be the right way to go about. Um, I don't really plan big as such, uh, but I'm an ardent fan of, um, um, you know, technology in sport. Uh, I will always pursue it. Um, I want to see uh, how far we can go in helping um, people get the right kind of um, support from the technology, especially in the coaching space and stuff. So that will be one of my passions. It's like uh, when you're playing, when you're, when you're schooling, you play sport all the time. So this technology and sport will be that particular space now. And um, of course, my career will be uh, something else. I mean, I'm a master free now. I don't know how I want to get involved in the sport. It could be um, a little bit of administration. It could be a little bit of um, getting into the mainstream sports. I'm happy doing my master refereeing now at this point in time. Um, so at, at this point in time, a lot of things are happening back home in India as far as uh, cricket and its administration is all concerned. So uh, we have to wait and watch what happens. Um, but as of now, I'm, I'm a very content match referee. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing uh, your, your stories and your experiences. Sure. We really enjoyed having you here. I Thank hope you, you enjoy your stay in the Bay Area. Right. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks.